Hi everyone, welcome to the solution videos for the third annual Brookfield Computer Programming Challenge. Um, in this video, we're gonna go over the solutions to all eight of the problems. And I'm gonna type them live for you guys so you can kind of see my process of um, how I might solve them. Um, I'm just gonna go in order, um, but roughly the problems from easiest to hardest were 99 red balloons was easiest, uh, frosty was probably the next easiest, uh, special snowflakes, next easiest, then uh, probably three would be the next easiest, then Windows 10, the next easiest. <clears throat> and then after that, it was a bit of a toss up. Um, Planes was pretty doable, um, although it didn't get solved. Linus did get solved. Frenemies was really close to getting solved. So those were the hardest three problems, uh, two, four, and five. Um, I would say of them, Frenemies was probably the most difficult. And then Planes was pretty easy to code, but required like a kind of complicated observation. Um, so it required a lot of thinking, but it was easy to code once you had figured it out. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go through the problems one by one and solve them live for you. So 99 red balloons was a pretty simple, uh, straightforward problem. Um, you have balloons released from time zero to time n minus one, and you wanna count how many are between a certain height range at a given time. Uh, so we can jump right into that. I need a scanner. And then we're going to read in N, L, H, and P. So then we can iterate through each balloon and calculate the height it'll be at. So it's released, or well, it'll travel upwards for t seconds, and then at time zero, it's basically a negative balloon height. So then we're going to need to store a count of how many balloons we've seen in the range. And at the end, we're going to want to um, to check what's in the range, we just need to make sure height is bigger than L and smaller than H. Do it. So let's see if uh, this is going to work. Cool, so it seems to match the example, so it's not necessarily right, but it's. Um, I'm pretty confident that it's right because I wrote the problem and this is the intended solution. Uh, so yeah, so that's the solution to balloons. Um, I'm gonna keep going on frenemies. So frenemies was a, a much harder problem. Um, so maybe like if you don't totally understand how the solution works, it's kind of okay. Um, maybe you look at some of the other problems first. But the idea with frenemies is that uh, you have a bunch of nodes in a graph. And when two people talk, they become frenemies, and then they stay frenemies forever. And not only do they become frenemies, but every frenemy of the first person becomes frenemies of every frenemy of the, of the second person. So in this example, if like these two people talk, for example, not only does three become frenemies with all of these people, but all of the three's friends do as well. So you end up with a graph that looks like this, or a list of frenemy connections a little like this. Um, so you need to know at any given point how many Frenemies, how many pairs of people are frenemies in total? Um, you can notice that since there can be up to like 10 to the fifth people, there can be a lot of frenemies. Um, so you can't actually keep track of all of them. You have to be able to count them while keeping track of them in a more efficient manner uh, because your computer can only do like 10 to the eighth things, 10 to the eighth operations per second. So you can't even store all 10 to the tenth of them. That'd be way too many. Um, so the general approach to this looks kind of like this. Um, on a given time, when two people talk to each other, let's say these two people talk to each other, you can keep track 
track of which group each person is in. So initially, everyone starts out in different groups. Then when two people talk, um, we're going to take one group, and move everyone in that group, and two into the other group. So for, exa for this example, we can take everyone in this group, move into that group, and then we leave these two people talk. So we're going to take everyone in this group, and move it to everyone in that group. And the number of edges we add is the number of people in one group times the number of people in the other group. Those are all the edges that we know. So uh, when we do that, that will we can like maintain maybe these two people talk. So it's, we added one times one edges. So maybe these two people talk. So we add all these edges. Um, so that would, that'll give us the right answer, but the hard part about doing that is um, how do we know, like, what I just said was like, we take one group and we add everyone in that group to the other group. So the, the order of talking might be something like this, maybe these two people talk, which is fine. Now these people talk to this person, so we have to add both of these people to that group. This person talks to this person, so we have to add all three of these people to this group. And now, um, now maybe this person talks to this person, so we have to add all of these people to this group. And as you can see, um, each person gets added to like almost n other groups if they're n people. So if they're ten to the fifth people, the first person gets added to ten to the fifth different groups. The second person gets added to like ten to the fifth minus one different groups. Um, etc. So, like, if you look at how big that grows relative to the number of people, you're going to be adding the person to a lot of groups, and you're going to be adding a lot of people to a lot of groups. So that winds up not really working. It winds up being too slow, and then we'll tell you. Um, so instead, what we can do is whenever we have two groups of people, Whichever group is smaller, and add the smaller group to the bigger group. And when we do that, we know these people might get added to different groups multiple times, but we know each part, each time it's added to a new group, the size of its group will double. And the size of your group can only double about 20 times before you reach all 10 to the fifth people, right? Before you're in the same group as everyone else. Your size is doubling every time. So when we do that, each person can only add it, be added to a group at most 20 times. And since n is only 10 to the fifth, then we only add people to groups 20 times 10 to the fifth times, which is definitely small enough. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the solution idea. And I can go ahead and implement that. We're going to need to know which group each thing is in. And we're also going to need to know who is in each group. So I'm going to make uh, an array of array lists.
So we're going to want to check them with the bar. So in the problem, we're given these are how many people are how many times these people talk, and these are the people that talk. Uh, since these are one indexed, and it usually winds up being easier in computer science if you handle them with the zero indexed, you can subtract one from both of these. So instead of looking at it as people one and four talk, I'm going to look at it as zero and three talk. And then I'll have people from zero to n minus one instead of from one to n, which I think is easier to handle. So yes, yeah, so this is the first person, and then this is the second person. So if these people are in the same group, then they're already friendly. me. So them talking doesn't change anything. If that's the case, we can just print the old answer. If they're not in the same group, then um, we're going to want to we're going to have to like merge some groups. So now I'm going to make A and B instead of being the people that are talking, be the groups that we're merging. So A equals So now we have the, the two groups that we're merging. Uh, the number of enemies we're going to add is going to be the size of each group multiplied. That's how many new edges we have. Uh, we want this to be long because each of these can be about 10 to the fifth big. So we multiply two numbers that are 10 to the fifth. in this, this else block. So we have to do that here. So uh, we want whichever one is smaller to be the first one. So if uh, if A is bigger, then we'll make, uh, we'll switch them so that we know A is always smaller. Store our, which group each thing is in, and also which things are in each group. Um, initially, the only thing in each group is like its own, your own person. Then we'll keep track of how many frenemies there are. We're going to iterate through all of the times in which two people talk. If two people are already in the same group when they talk, it doesn't change anything. But if they're in different groups, um, 
then we want to keep track of which group they're in. And then the number of frenemies we add is the product of the sizes of the two groups. Then we add everything in the smaller group to the bigger group. We know this will only happen. Um, per person. So this this will definitely run in time. Um, yeah, and that's solution to frenemies. So if you have any questions about it, feel free to either post in the comments or send me an email or anything. I'm to be happy to answer. All right, so let's move on to Frosty. So Frosty was probably the second easiest problem. It's pretty doable. Um, in this problem, you have uh, well, you're Frosty the milkshake, and you have to reach your best friend's house. Uh, and your best friend's a jingle ball rock. So you have to travel n spaces forward, and you have a series of turns. And on each turn, you can do one of three things. If you are on a space that has a refrigerator, you can stay in that space for a turn. This will cool you off by one degree, so you get one degree colder. Um, if you're not in a space that's in a refrigerator, you can move one degree, you can move one position forward or one position backward. Um, and then if you do that, you'll change your position. But also, since it's since the sun's hot outside, uh, you'll get one degree warmer if you do that. And if your temperature ever gets above zero degrees, then you'll melt and get all sticky. So you want to avoid doing that. Um, and thankfully you have your own refrigerator. There are a bunch of elves that also have refrigerators. So you can use their elves, or you can use the elves refrigerators if you need to in order to get to Jingle Ball Rock's house. So um, the question is, what's the fewest number of turns you need in order to get to the target house? <coughs> So in this first example, um, you start at position zero. Start at position zero, you start here. And then you're trying to get to this position four. Um, there is one elf at position three. And uh, you start at zero degrees. So what you can do is you can wait for three turns and then get to negative three degrees. Once you're at negative three degrees, you can take three steps forward. Then you'll be at zero degrees when you're here. And you can wait for one more turn, you'll be at negative one degree. And then you'll get uh, hit here at zero degrees. And that takes eight turns total. So the important observation for this problem is that you don't actually have to use any of the elf's refrigerators. So in this example, um, you can use the elf's refrigerator. And in this way of doing it, you do use the elf's refrigerator. But you don't actually need to. Um, in fact, you can just wait for four turns here, and then you could spend four turns passing forward. Uh, and really, since like you can always reach your refrigerator, and you might be able to reach an elves refrigerator, but you also might not, it also just makes sense for you to never even worry about visiting the elves. Like you can just use your refrigerator instead anytime that you would want to use some elves refrigerator. So if you do that, then you just know you have to wait until you're negative n degrees. And then once you're negative 100 degrees or colder, uh, then you can just start walking across and you can walk right across. Um, so that's a little bit of math to figure out, but we can put it up real quick. D is uh, negative in the input. You have it to negative. I think it's a little bit easier if we have it as a positive value. So um, we're going to need to wait n turns in order to um, walk across, or not wait n turns, we're going to need to walk for n turns. Um, and then some number of turns in order to cool off to be negative d degrees. So the number of turns we would need to wait is usually going to be n minus d. Um, so if we need to be negative 8 degrees, we're currently negative 7 degrees, then d would be 7, uh, and n would be 8. So this would be we need to wait one turn. But sometimes d might be uh, 
like they might already be cold enough. And if that's the case, we don't need to wait anymore. We can just start locking right away. Um, like I said, we don't actually care about where the elves are, so we don't need to read in the elf alphabet. Um, we could if we wanted to, it doesn't matter. So let's see if this works. Right. Um, yeah, and that is how you do frosty. Um, it's based on all the code, um, but it's kind of an interesting problem in that it's not obvious that you can just ignore the elements from the beginning. I think. All right, so that is uh, it's frosty. So let's go on to the next problem, Linus. Um, Linus is an interesting problem. So the way Linus works is Linus and Spooky have both memorized some song. This song is a sequence of n mutters and notes um, each between a and g and on a given turn uh or well so they're initially they, they start playing one note per second uh, and they they're each playing the note and that's fine they're going to play the duet it's going to be great however uh there is a commercial break and unfortunately they forgot where they were before the commercial break when the commercial break ends they don't really know what to do and instead of like talking to each other and figuring out where they're gonna start, they just both say, all right, let's start at a random place. They do it without talking, I guess. Um, and you wanna know how long they're gonna play after they start playing at a random place. And how it works when they start is like, let's say Linus starts here, and Snoopy starts here. They both play their first note, and then as long as their first note matches, they're gonna keep playing their next notes. Um, and if they ever play two notes that don't match, then they'll know, oh, we started at the wrong spot, so we should probably stop and, uh, like, figure out what's going on and then start from a good spot. Um, but if Linus starts here and Snoopy starts here, for example, then when Snoopy gets to the end, Snoopy will put down his instrument and Linus will know, oh, okay, well, that means we're done, but Linus will also stop playing. So basically, they continue playing until either they've messed up or one of them reaches the end. And then you have to put, or you have to print the expected um, number of notes they play. So the problem would be pretty straightforward if we could just naively start at any possible starting point and then iterate through um, to see how long it matches. But the problem with that is that's going to be n cubed because there are n squared starting points, and then for each one of those, there might be n different um, matchings that we would have to do at every position. So instead of doing that, we can use dynamic programming and we can store the first or the position that Snoopy's at, the position that the Linus is at, and we can write a method, a recursive method, that given those two things will tell us um, how long we'll play for. And if we do that and we store, um, like this for every input, we'll have for every same input, we'll print the same output, uh, then we can store the answer, and if we ever get that input again, then we can print, print the answer right away. And since there are only um, n squared possible inputs, we can add in n squared time. So here's what the code for that kind of looks like. So we're going to start across all possible storage points, just 
for the total length that they would play. So we're going to divide that by the number of positive rate points, and that'll be the average length that they play. Um, so to do that, we're going to need to know the GCD. That's uh, just um, the two columns GCD function. Pretty, pretty classic. This will um, get the GCD of total and the number of starting points. And then we can print, print like we end up added at the numerator, also the denominator, and that's the answer. Now we need to calculate uh, the, how long minus infinity will play if they start at two positions. So we know that if um, them is the last position, or if they are playing different notes. Um, if either of those are the case, then we're going to stop after playing this note. If either of those are the case, then they'll play this note, and they'll continue on to the next note. So that's fantastic. Um, however, there is one, one problem with this still, which is this method gets called from here and is called times. And then each time it's called, it could call itself n different times. So this method gets called n cubed times um, because when it calls itself, it might take order n time to finish. Uh, so in order to remove a factor of n to make our code n squared, which will be fast enough, then um, if we ever receive the same input multiple times, then we should know to just quit out the second time. So we can make an array. If we haven't seen it before, we should store our answer so that the next time we see it, we can return the answer. We don't have to do this um, sorter and recursion again. Alright, fantastic. So, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, let's see if my code works, I guess. Negative nine. That's a problem. Oh, see what the negative one is going to make the negative one. Um, when it starts with negative one, eventually it will be the negative one. So now it seems to be uh, great. For the first best case, at least. That was Linus. Um, it, this problem kind of required you to know what dynamic programming is. So it's a pretty simple dynamic programming if you've seen it before. If you haven't, it's a bit tricky. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a general idea to dynamic programming. Basically, you have to write a recursive method, and uh, the recursive method it only has n squared inputs, and then everything that happens in here is all order one, and it'll be n squared instead of n cubed, which is then the if. Yeah, that's Linus. Um, we can move on to planes. 
So the problem planes, you have um, you really like planes, all sorts of planes, Cartesian planes, woodworking planes, planes with grass, even airplanes. Uh, but there's one thing you don't like about airplanes though, and that's layovers. So you want to have as, as few layovers as possible. And to address this problem, the Belarusian Caring by Plane Company is going to add a bunch of new flights to their existing set of flights. So, for example, maybe they have flights between airports one and two and also one and three, and they're going to add n new flights. So they always add, the number of flights they add is always equal to the number of airports that they have. So since they have four airports, they're going to add four new flights. And you get ahead flights between two and four, one and four, two and three, and three and four. And if you do that, then if you want to fly from any airport to any other airport, it's always going to take at most one flight. There's always going to be a direct flight there. Um, however, if they only have like multiple flights between one and three, for example, then if you had four more, there's no way to make it so that um, there's a direct flight between every pair. Um, but you can make it so that within two flights, you can always go from any node to any other node. Uh, if you do this, for example. So if you're going from two to three, you can fly directly there. But if you're going from like two to four, for example, you could fly to one, and then you could fly to two. So you want to know among all ways of adding these new blue edges, what is the shortest you can make the farthest pair of uh, airports away? So if you want to pause the video and think about it for a bit, that's kind of a maybe a good idea. All right, so I'm gonna assume you've had time to think. Um, so one observation is that what is the biggest the answer could possibly be? Uh, and it's kind of an interesting question. Uh, we know it's at least two. We have an example where it's two. But it turns out the answer is never, ever going to be bigger than two. And the reason why is because, let's say we have no flights initially. We're going to add n flights. We can always add flights to connect every node to the first node. And after we're, we're done with that, we still have one flight left over. What we can do is like, waste it. It doesn't matter. Um, now, we can go from any node to the first node on our first flight, and then the first node to wherever our second node would be on the second flight. So within two flights, it's always possible to get from wherever we're trying to go to wherever our destination is, or from our start to destination, um, no matter what our start and destination are. So since we know the answer is always going to be two, uh, we just need to know, can the answer be one? And the answer can be one in cases where we have enough flights to directly connect every pair. So I guess I'll draw what that might look like. Am I missing any? Yeah, I'm missing some. That looks kind of right. Maybe that's enough. Um, oh, no. Anyway, okay, how many flights do you need in total? So you're going to need, you have n nodes. For each node, there are n minus one other nodes that it's going to have edges to, but then we'll have to go to each edge twice. So this node goes to three other nodes, so we count these three edges. But also, we'll count these three edges from nodes two, four, and three as well. So we double count every edge, so we divide by two. So that's how many edges we're going to need. And we need to know if after adding our n new edges, we'll have at least this many edges. And if we do, then we'll be fine. Otherwise, we won't be. So let's uh, So what I'm doing here is I'm making a flight class, and um, I'm going to store from the center smaller of the two edges and two is going to be the bigger of the two edges. That way we treat uh, three one the same as three. Um, then I'm going to need to sort my 
my array of plates. So initially, if um, the nodes you're flying from are different, the smaller the two nodes are different, then I'll compare those. Otherwise, I'll compare the bigger of the two nodes. Um, so now we just need to read it. So if M is equal to zero, then there are going to be zero unique flights. If M isn't zero, there's going to be at least one unique flight. The first one's going to be unique. And then um, then we'll have the flights, and then for every adjacent pair, if they're different, then we have another unique flight. And then finally at the end, um, since we can add n new flights, we're going to have that many unique flights we can possibly add as well. So now we just need to know if that unique is big enough. And if it is big enough, then Everything has a direct connection. Otherwise, we're going to have to go through some intermediate node. So let's run this code, see if it works. Okay, fantastic. So um, I'll have to code again real quick. I'm going to construct all the points. We have to make sure to treat 1, 3, and 3, 1 the same. Uh, we're going to sort our plates, and then we're going to count how many adjacent pairs are different. So if two, if we have multiple duplicate plates, they'll be next to each other on this sorted list. Um, so we won't count them as being unique. But otherwise, we count how many unique plates there are. And also, since we can add a bunch of new plates, we'll count all of those as well. And at the end, if we have enough plates, then we'll print 1. Otherwise, we'll print 0. All right, so that's plates. Let's move on to snowflakes. So snowflakes is kind of an interesting problem. Um, it's like a graph theory problem, except it doesn't require a lot of the common graph theory algorithms like EFS or DFS or like strongly connected components or something like that. Um, so in this problem, we define a snowflake to be something that looks like this. Basically, if there's exactly one node in a component that has a degree that isn't one, then this is a snowflake. So all of these things are snowflakes. This has a degree zero, this is a degree two, this is a degree six. Um, if there's more than one node that has a degree that isn't one, or if all nodes have degree one, so all nodes have degree one here, so that's not a snowflake. And in these, there are multiple nodes that have degree greater than one, um, then it's not a snowflake. So now we call a snowflake special <clears throat> if it's the only snowflake in a graph that has that number of nodes. So all three of these are special, but you can imagine we had another one of these three by one snowflakes, um, and then neither of them would be special, just the one and the six would be special. So if we're given a graph, we want to count how many snowflakes it contains. Um, we can check if something's a snowflake just by checking if it has a degree that isn't one, and everything around it has a degree exactly to equal to one. And if that's the case, then we know that it's a snowflake, because everything around it um, has to be connected directly to it, can't be connected to anything else, but it's degree one. And 
yeah, I guess that's kind of the solution to the problem. So we'll go into that now. as an array of array lists again. zero index, and I'm going to add them to my list of fetches. So now um, I want to see which nodes are snowflakes, and if they are snowflakes, I want to see how many of each size snowflake there is. So, size of n is equal to 1, then we know it's not a snowflake. So if this thing has a size equal to 1, it has exactly one edge, if it's degrees 1, then it's not a snowflake, so we can skip it. If, now we have to check if any of the things it's connected to have a degree that isn't 1. So if that thing has a size that isn't one, then we know this is not a snowflake. So then we want to keep going to the next one. So now if everything we're connected to all has degree one, and we don't have degree one, then we are snowflake. So then Snowflakes we have for this size. And we want to have initially have initially zero special. And we want to make snowflakes we have of each size. If we have exactly one snowflake of a size, then it's a special we have a special snowflake of that size. If we have zero of a size, we don't have any snowflakes of that size. And if we have two or more, then they're not special. So we only count the pair of the count one. And if that's the case, we can increment how many special snowflakes we have. Finally, at the end, we want to print out how many special snowflakes we have. Alright, so let's walk through the code one more time. Come on, actually, let's make sure it works first. So let's do code again one more time. Remember that this case was just very accurate with spoken code. Oh, not of course. So what we're going to do is we're going to add all the edges to our graph. And we're going to iterate through every possible center. If the center has a degree of one, that's not really a center. So 
like this can't be the center of some snowflake. If it has a size equal one, I'm gonna look through all the things it says edges to, and if any of those things have some degree that isn't one, then we know this isn't a snowflake. So we're gonna keep going. If they all do, then we have one more snowflake of this size. So we increment our count there. And then finally, we want to count how many unique snowflakes we have. So we count them here. Um, yes, that's solution to snowflakes. I kind of went over that pretty quick, but um, hopefully that made sense. If not, feel free to let me know what didn't and uh, we can talk about it. All right, so two more problems left. Let's do three real quick. Um, so the intended solution to three looks something like this. Uh, you can draw like someone like this and then since you start at the top, uh, you won't intersect yourself at all. Um, so that works, uh, and that's pretty easy to decode up and to understand. Um, but another solution that people come up with that I thought was pretty interesting, maybe even, well definitely even easier to code, um, is that you start at 0, 0, and you go to 1, 1. Uh, and then you can go to 2, and then you can increase your slope, so your slope is now 2. So yeah, that solution works. Um, a similar solution, instead of increasing your slope by one, you can go increase it by some amount that's uh, like a little bit more than one each time. Um, so you can go from zero, zero, to one, one, to two, and then two squared, three, and then three squared, which is nine, etc. Uh, and that's also like super easy to code, and it also increases your slope in the same way. There are lots of solutions to this problem, and I had a program that I would run in order to judge to make sure they're correct. Um, so that was kind of why bounds were small. Uh, it's possible to check if the polygon is self intersecting in n log n, but I wanted to make sure my code was correct. It was pretty easy to write the, the n squared and check. So, So we're going to need two read in, and then we're going to want to iterate through each of the parts that we should print. And then we're going to want to print that point. So if we try three points, then we get 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 4. Zero, one, one, and then two, root four, and then something like that. We got a triangle, a little bit of a weird triangle, but it works. We have three points, we got zero, zero, one, one, two, four, and three, nine, and nine. Um, yeah, that works. These will never reach exactly 180 degrees, they'll be. Less than 180 degrees. And then we can try the next case. So if we have 1,000 points, then our points stay under 1,000 squared, uh, which is exactly under 10 to the 9. So that solution works. Yes, that solution to 3. Um, very simple to code, but kind of challenging to come up with. Um, yeah, okay, so 
let's go over Windows 10 now, the last problem. So in Windows 10, this problem was based off the fact that uh, Windows went straight from Windows 8 to Windows 10. Uh, there were a bunch of interesting reasons about why that might be. One reason was because Windows 95 and Windows 98 both start with Windows 9. So if you were writing code that checked the version of the operating system and you used like the prefix of it to check if it was Windows 95 or 98, that code might work unexpectedly. Um, it's possible that was the reason. It's also possible they wanted to like separate themselves from Windows 8 because that was kind of a failure. Um, but I think the most likely reason is actually because like from a marketing perspective, saying it's version 9, it sounds kind of unsatisfying. It sounds like, oh, it's almost a perfect 10, but it's not quite there yet. It's like, it's almost where we want it to be. Um, and if you're trying to sell a product to consumers, that's not what they want. So the same thing happened with the iPhone 9. Apple skipped making the iPhone 9. They went straight from iPhone 8 to iPhone X, which is like the iPhone 10, then after that, the iPhone 11. Um, and that might have been because like they had a really good product and they didn't want people to think that it was like almost as good as they would wind up being. They wanted people to think, well, this is this is what I should buy, this is it. Um, so that problem kind of builds off this idea. So if you have a certain number of digits that you're not allowed to use, you want to find the nth number that has none of those digits. <laughs> so oh, also, um, it's kind of important, zero is never unsatisfactory. I don't know that it really matters too much, but it helps with like not having leading zeros. Uh, Cause like, if you look at the number seven, it's really a bunch of zeros followed by a seven. So it's like, well, do we count those or not? Um, so it makes that not an issue anymore. So one thing to notice is if we are writing something we're only allowed to, or, and we're not allowed to use D digits, that's the same as writing something, but we are allowed to use 10 minus D digits. Um, and if that's the case, then we're writing something in base 10 minus D, and then we're changing the names of the digits. So if we're only allowed to use the digits 0 and 5, for example, we'd be writing something in binary, except instead of using zeros and ones, we'd be using zeros and fives. Um, and that would be the, the number we're supposed to print at the end. So that's kind of the solution path to this problem that you're supposed to follow. Um, and rewriting numbers is a pretty common AP computer science trick, it comes up a lot. So I'll go over uh, just kind of how you can do it. Of course, we're going to need a scanner. should convert to the new base. Um, we're also going to need to know what the ith legal number is. So um, so if this number is legal, then the i legal number at whatever number we're on is going to be i. So we're just making track of what each of the numbers we're allowed to use are. So we're just in here. So once we have that, then we can. Uh, convert our convert end into whatever base we need to. 
so we don't have to worry about the case where it's just zero. So while well, end isn't zero, then um, current digit is going to be n minus case. And then we want to divide base out. Um, that should be long, but base is always going to be small. I'm not worried about that. So the problem with this is that this will give us our digits from least significant to most significant. But when you print a number left to right, you print it from most significant to least significant. Um, so we're going to want to store our answer in some array list and then print it at the end. bit numbers. So this file loop will run 64 times, worst case. Um, and yeah, that's solution to Windows. So hopefully uh, these problems made sense to you. Um, if you have any questions about the problem set, feel free to send me an email or whatever. Um, if you have any suggestions for next year, feel free to send me an email. If you'd like to get your code back, I still have all of the code. Um, if you're confused about why you're getting it wrong or whatever, uh, you can send me an email and I will respond to it. Also, if you don't like human communication, that's cool too. And in that case, you can just download the data from my website. Um, should be right here. And then you can get it here. Uh, you can download the data and also touch solutions. Uh, and then we're putting the solution video up right now. Right as I record this, or as soon as I'm done. Um, so yeah, uh, that's all. Thank you for watching, and hope to see you guys next year. Goodbye. <laughs>